This video is a basic guide to performing an auxiliary brachial plexus block safely and effectively. The auxiliary block can be used to provide surgical anesthesia of the arm from the mid-upper arm to the hand. The main nerves that are not covered are the suprascapular nerve to the shoulder joint and the intercostal brachial nerve supplying the medial upper arm. The intercostal brachial nerve can, however, be covered simply with a subcutaneous wheel of local anesthetic. A linear transducer is always adequate, as is a 50 mm long needle, even in the obese or large patient. Depending on your precision, 20 milliliters of local anesthetic may be sufficient. I do not recommend, however, exceeding 40 milliliters. We use a mixture of lidocaine and bupivacaine for surgical anesthesia to achieve a good balance between onset and duration of block, but pure solutions of lidocaine or repivacaine can also be used. Epinephrine is generally recommended to detect intravascular injection. The patient is placed supine, with or without their head up depending on comfort. The shoulder must be abducted enough to expose the axilla. External rotation is ideal, but not absolutely necessary, especially if the patient has shoulder joint issues. Position yourself in the ultrasound machine appropriately depending on whether you prefer to needle using the along or across approach. Novices may find needle alignment easier in the along approach and you will not be forced to use your non-dominant hand. Start by placing the probe in a transverse orientation over the axillary artery. Note that this image is wrong, however, as the probe is too low. The probe must be placed more proximal, up against the pectoral fold as a rule. This ensures that the probe is over the conjoint tendon of teres major and latissimus dorsi, and that all the nerves, with the exception of the musculocutaneous nerve, will be located above or anterior to the conjoint tendon around the artery. This is the ultrasound view that will be obtained. The axillary artery is the primary landmark. Two muscle groups are visible that define the boundaries of the neurovascular bundle. The conjoint tendon of the latissimus dorsi and teres major under the axillary artery and the coracobrachialis muscle. There are often multiple axillary veins, but they are readily compressible and are not major obstacles. The radial nerve is always lying on top of the conjoint tendon, usually medial to the artery in the 5 o'clock area, but sometimes under or lateral to it in the 7 o'clock area. It is hyperechoic and almost always larger than the other nerves. The median nerve is always adjacent to the border of coracobrachialis in the 9 to 12 o'clock quadrant around the artery. The ulnar nerve is always more medial to the median nerve and lies above the radial nerve. Finally, the musculocutaneous nerve usually lies within coracobrachialis but is the most variable in location. It can lie anywhere along the intramuscular fascial plane and may even be adjacent to the artery. To identify the musculocutaneous nerve, slide the probe laterally to image the coracobrachialis. Remember that the nerve may be adjacent to the artery and the median nerve, sometimes giving the impression of a large median nerve. Moving the probe distally will reveal the nerve as it slides laterally in a fascial plane through the muscle. It often changes shape depending on its position within the muscle. Recognizing fascial layers helps with identification, especially as each nerve lies within its own fascial compartment. This has implications for needling and injection, which we will discuss next. To sum up, the entire neurovascular bundle lies within a triangle defined by the superficial investing fascia of the arm, the conjoint tendon, and the coracobrachialis. The radial nerve, in particular, lies in its own posterior compartment. The median nerve and ulnar nerve are in the anterior compartment and often separated by a thin septum. The musculocutaneous nerve, as discussed, can lie anywhere within the fascial plane that runs through coracobrachialis. For more tips on pattern recognition and nerve identification, Check out the second video in this series.
The simplest method of injection, particularly if you are unsure of where the nerves are, is to perform a dual injection perivascular technique. Ensure that the probe is placed proximal enough that the conjoint tendon is clearly visible, as well as the boundaries of the axillary artery. Advance the needle in plane to the posterior lateral aspect of the artery. There is usually a fascial pop as the needle tip passes from the muscle into the posterior fascial compartment. Inject about 15 milliliters or half of your selected volume here, watching to ensure that it spreads under the artery. Withdraw and redirect the needle tip to the anterolateral aspect of the artery and inject another 15 milliliters here to spread over the artery. This dual injection is generally recommended over a single posterior injection of 30 mils to ensure adequate spread. Finally, insert the needle tip into the fascial plane next to the musculocutaneous nerve and inject 5 milliliters here. This edited video illustrates this approach. The needle is advanced to the posterior aspect of the artery and injection is performed here. Some of you may also appreciate the radial nerve in its position at 5 o'clock to the artery. The needle is then redirected to the anterior aspect of the artery. The median nerve, if it's visible, should be respected. Finally, the musculocutaneous nerve is targeted by piercing its enveloping sheath. The final post-injection survey confirms that there is adequate local spread and all the nerves should now be easily visible surrounded by local anesthetic. However, I favour and always perform a perineural injection technique. With a little practice, each of the nerves are easy to identify. The radial on the conjoint tendon the median nerve and ulnar nerve above the artery, and the musculocutaneous nerve in the coracobrachialis muscle. In my opinion, this deliberate targeting reduces the risk of paresthesia and nerve injury and allows me to be more confident of a successful block. The process starts by advancing the needle towards the junction between conjoint tendon and artery to enter the radial nerve compartment. There is often a vein in this area but it is usually pushed aside by the blunt block needle and is rarely pierced. Inject half mil boluses of local anesthetic to hydrodissect the plane between the conjoint tendon and the artery. Local anesthetic will flow along the conjoint tendon into the posterior compartment, lifting up the radial nerve. Key features of correct injection are the expansion of local anesthetic that outlines the curved lower border or contour of the radial nerve. Inject a total of 5 to 8 mils in this area. Note that it is not uncommon for the needle tip to advance too deeply and pierce the conjoint tendon, in which case hydrodissection will produce a linear spread pattern of local anesthetic that doesn't expand as a pocket or outline the radial nerve. Withdrawing the needle tip slightly and performing a test injection again will usually solve this problem. After the radial nerve injection, withdraw the needle out of the coracobrachialis muscle and redirect it towards the median nerve. Depending on the position of the nerve, the needle can be advanced to either pass above the nerve, that is between the investing fascia and the nerve, or below the nerve, between the artery and the nerve. Inject 5 to 6 milliliters of local anesthetic around the median nerve, which also then hydrodissects a safe path towards the ulnar nerve. Continue with injections of half to one milliliter of local anesthetic and advance towards the ulnar nerve. An injection of five to six milliliters in total is usually enough to surround the ulnar nerve. Finally, target the musculocutaneous nerve by withdrawing the needle and shifting the probe as needed to clearly visualize the nerve. 
advance to place the tip within the fascial envelope of the nerve while avoiding the nerve itself. Do not hesitate to make a new skin puncture, especially if the musculocutaneous nerve lies very far away from the main plexus so that the needle angle is not overly steep. This video illustrates the process. The superficial investing fascia in the conjoint tendon define the neurovascular bundle. Note that this old video has wrongly labeled the coracobrachialis as the biceps. The position of the four main terminal nerves is as shown. The radial nerve is under the artery and the muscular cutaneous nerve has a relatively late takeoff. The red asterisk shows where the needle tip should be placed initially. There is a fascial layer that must be pierced as the needle crosses from muscle into the neurovascular compartment. This is signaled by a visual and tactile pop. Needle tip position is then confirmed by test injection. In this case, a linear pattern of spread is seen, indicating that the tip is too deep and is splitting the conjoint tendon. The needle is then withdrawn slightly, and now injection is seen in a different layer, and more importantly, is outlining the contours of the radial nerve. Six to eight milliliters of local anesthetic is usually injected here. The location of the musculocutaneous nerve in this case allows it to be targeted during withdrawal of the needle. The tip is carefully positioned within the sheath of the musculocutaneous nerve and 5 milliliters injected here will surround the nerve without need for excessive repositioning attempts. The median nerve is targeted next, and as discussed, there are two options to approach the nerve. In this case, because the nerve is not overlying the lateral aspect of the artery, I have chosen to go between nerve and artery. Hydrodissection should be performed as needed to create a safe path for advancement. The artery may also be compressed by the needle out of the way to get under the nerve and safely into the area of the ulnar nerve. At all times, gentle probing advancement and hydrodissection should be used to minimize needle trauma to the nerve. This second video illustrates the process again, a little bit more completely. The needle is inserted onto the conjoint tendon close to the artery. The radial nerve is visible at 5 to 6 o'clock. Hydrolocation lifts the artery off the tendon, and correct spread in this case is confirmed by expansion and outlining of the curved border of the radial nerve. The needle is then withdrawn and inserted to target the median nerve. Once again, we pass between the nerve and the artery in this case. Hydrodissection creates a safe path for needle advancement under the median nerve. Note that we compress the artery again out of the way to safely bypass the median nerve and reach the ulnar nerve. Gradual probing rolls the ulnar nerve, revealing its borders, and the needle tip is depressed to go under it. After a small pop, injection here now spreads around the ulnar nerve in its compartment. Finally, the musculocutaneous nerve is targeted by piercing the fascial sheath next to the nerve. Note the tenting and the bounce back as the fascia is pierced. The tip always advances a little bit too far and must be pulled back slightly for local anesthetic to spread correctly within the plane. Here are some clinical pearls to finish. Do not worry too much about vascular puncture. The artery is actually very difficult to puncture with a blunt block needle. 
Veins may be pierced occasionally, however, so always ensure that test injection of a half a mil of local anesthetic produces visible fluid expansion. This will exclude intravascular injection. I also recommend using epinephrine as another marker for intravascular injection. Try to avoid inducing paresthesia and nerve trauma. Always approach nerves and vessels at a tangent to their surface to avoid puncturing them. Nerves and artery should roll away as the needle presses on them, and that will ensure that no puncture will occur. Finally, be aware and conscious of tactile and visual fascial pops as you pierce the various septae that surround the nerves. Thank you for watching.